Good evening, everyone. You're very welcome to this uh, webinar from Engineers Ireland uh, Energy Environment Time and Action Division. Uh, this evening, my name is Barry McMullen. I'm the incoming uh, chair of the Energy Environment and Climate Action Division of Engineers Ireland. So you're uh, all very welcome. We run uh, uh, a program of monthly uh, events, evening events, uh, open to engineers, obviously, but open to the wider public. In traditional times, uh, they, they these would have been physical events in Engineers Ireland headquarters in Clyde Road. We haven't had the opportunity to restart in Clyde Road just yet, but we're hoping to do so. But we, they have been webcast uh, in recent years anyway, even pre-COVID, so we, uh, the, the, the events are made available uh, more widely. Um, so welcome to everybody, engineers uh, and non-engineers, to this, evening, this evening's event, um, End Game for Fossil Fuels in the Irish Power System. It gives me great pleasure to welcome uh, Noel Cunniff, Chartered Engineer, Member of Engineers Ireland this evening. Noel was recently appointed in May 2021 as the Chief Executive of Wind Energy Ireland. Um, prior to this, and congratulations, Noel, on that appointment. Thanks, Barry. Prior to that, Noel led Wind Energy Ireland's policy development in driving uh, develop policy across all aspects of the onshore and offshore renewable industry in Ireland. Previously, he was a renewable integration lead um, at Airgrid in operations planning and innovation department at Airgrid. Uh, he was responsible for leading aspects of Airgrid's uh, developing a secure, sustainable power system, the DS3 uh, programme, and the Horizon 2020 project, EU CISFLEX. Um, and so, look, we've had huge interest in this event tonight. Uh, the, the actual registrations, I think, were over 200. I'm not sure, we'll have to wait and see how many people actually turn up. Um, just in terms of... Uh, uh, administrative procedures. Um, the, uh, all participants should have access to the Q&A forum. Um, for, so uh, after Noel gives his presentation, we will have an opportunity for questions and answers. So if you have questions you specifically want Noel to respond to, please post them in the Q&A forum. Um, you also have access to a chat, but that's really uh, just for uh, background discussion. We won't be checking the chat for questions for Noel at the end. So if you want questions to be answered by Noel, the place to put them is, is in the Q&A forum. So with that, um, I will hand over to Noel. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Uh, thanks very much, Barry, for the introduction and uh, welcome everybody tonight. I'm delighted to be able to kick off this session of a series of Engineers Ireland presentations. Um, I've attended many of these over the last 10 plus years in, in Clyde Road and it's uh, great to be here this evening to, to give one myself. Um, as Barry gave the a very kind introduction there. Um, I uh, used to parade as an engineer um, and now I, I talk a lot uh, about things that we need to do in terms of how to implement renewables in Ireland. So I don't get to use a spreadsheet very often, but it's great to be able to have the discussion here tonight um, where I can present something that is uh, both very relevant for where Ireland needs to go from a renewables perspective and, and really reducing carbon off the power system, but also there's some uh, good clean fun in uh, heavy duty electrical engineering that I'll try and get through a bit of tonight as well. So. Um, just for background, for anyone that doesn't know us, I'm not going to do a, a big introduction for Wind Energy Ireland, but we're um, the largest renewable organization on the island. We've about 160 members, uh, ranging from all aspects of the supply chain for onshore and offshore wind. So right from the people that, uh, I guess, kick off a project, look to find a land area, sign the land, go and get planning permission for a particular onshore or offshore wind energy project, bring that through to fruition, be able to connect it to the grid uh, and then operate and, and maintain it over time. And we'd also look at, uh, have as part for membership people like, you know, the financial institutes, the banks, the planners. So everyone across that supply chain, um, uh, we, we cater for in Wind Energy Ireland. Um, so to get things started and to kick things off on, on a report, first of all, I'm just going to set out what I think uh, should be, if you have one takeaway tonight, what is that? Um, and I think that takeaway is that we can definitely, absolutely deliver a zero carbon electricity system in Ireland by 2035. That is something that we have the capability to do, the technology to do, 
um, and the, the economics of it also actually do stack up, which I'll show you a little later on. But we've seen in recent days, the UK, Boris Johnson has committed to the UK being a zero carbon electricity system by 2035. We've seen about two months ago, the IEA produced a report highlighting how to get to net zero carbon uh, on a global scale by 2050. But as part of that, they really called out that we need to have all advanced economies having zero carbon electricity systems by 2035. So a big milestone along that. Now, to get into some of the details for how we're going to get there, I thought I'd tell you about where we're at today and where we're starting from. So... Many people will be aware that Ireland had a number of um, renewable targets for 2020. So there was a renewable target for energy, a renewable target for electricity, heat and transport. And the only one of them, unfortunately, that was met was renewable electricity. So we aim to hit a target back in 2008 of 40% renewable electricity. We actually achieved 43% renewable electricity last year and wind energy made up about 36 to 38% of that. That made us, would you believe, number one in the world for onshore wind energy. So many countries in the world have uh, both onshore and offshore resources. Denmark as a country is actually number one in the world when it comes to overall total of electricity demand met by wind energy. But we actually beat them for onshore wind. So we are number one in the world for onshore wind energy. So I think it's very safe to say that wind energy for Ireland has been a really big success story and something that we should be very, very proud of as a, as a country over the last 10, 15, 20 years. So that's where we're at at the moment. The pipeline of projects and where we're looking to progress and develop over the next um, 10 years in particular just to start off on the onshore wind side, so there's actually a, a pipeline of projects in development right now of about 10,000 megawatts of onshore wind energy in various stages of development, ranging from the early stages of planning to projects that have planning that are looking to connect onto the grid um, to those that are ready to enter into renewable auctions. So a lot of you will be familiar with the first uh, res auction which took place last year and the next res auction for onshore will take place next year along with onshore wind and with solar. We also have a huge pipeline of offshore wind energy which is um, preparing to be able to deliver for 2030. So we're aiming to get to 5,000 megawatts of offshore wind energy in Ireland by 2030. To do that, there's a pipeline there at the moment of over 20,000 megawatts. And we actually need that because there's going to be a lot of attrition in the, the planning process for, for both onshore and offshore. There's going to be attrition when it comes to being able to connect to the grid in time for 2030. And there's going to be attrition when it comes to renewable energy auctions. So there's absolutely going to be projects that are successful, but there has to be projects that are unsuccessful in auctions as well. So we need those these, these sizes of pipelines to be able to deliver for 2030. There's also a very sizable solar PV pipeline, which is great to see coming through to help support both the grid and at a residential level for 2030 as well and help hit our targets there too. Um, so that's where the pipelines are at. What are we trying to do as a country? So as a country, the Climate Action Bill in March set a goal of trying to half our emissions uh, in our entire economy between uh, now and 2030. So we need to be able to cut our emissions from a little over 60 million tonnes, which where we're at today, to about 30 million tonnes by 2030. And renewable electricity is going to need to do a lot of that heavy lifting because not only are we going to need to decarbonise the electricity sector, and uh, we're also going to need to decarbonise heat and transport. There's a huge uh, ambition there for the rollout of electric vehicles, huge ambition there for the rollout of heat pumps. So in, in order to be able to deliver on this, we need to be able to deliver that renewable energy, use it as efficiently as possible, and really maximize um, the amount of renewable electricity we can get to our grid to help heat our homes and power our journeys in our, in our EVs and heat pumps. So that's where we're at at the moment. And that's just a bit of background that I wanted to give before going into the end game report, which is why I'm here to, to speak to you tonight. Um, Many of you will be familiar with a piece of work that we did back in 2018 called the 70 by 30 report. So this was a, a vision at the time for how we could get to a 70% renewable electricity system by 2030. And then this was subsequently made to be Ireland's uh, target in the 2019 Climate Action Plan. And we saw earlier on in the week with the release of the National Development Plan that that target of 70% resi has actually been now increased to 80% resi uh, by 2030. 
following on from that, then we had the program for government. So this really committed to um, a, a huge amount of emissions reductions that we were going to need to see between now and 2030 that I just spoke about, but it also upped the ante when it came to the amount of renewable capacity that we were hoping to deliver on our grid between now and 2030. So for onshore wind energy, there's a goal of trying to get to 8.2 gigawatts of, of onshore wind capacity that compares to where we're at today, which is around 4.2. So we need to add on about 4,000 megawatts or four gigawatts of onshore wind energy. For offshore wind, we need to get to 5,000 megawatts or five gigawatts uh, from where we're at today, which is only 25. So we only have one very small offshore wind farm off the coast of uh, Arklow and County Wicklow. Earlier this year then as well, we had uh, what was called the shaping our electricity future. So a really excellent um, consultation that Airgrid and Sony ran earlier this year, which really highlighted the need for grid development and presented a number of options for how we would develop the grid. And contained within that report was, um, uh, again, an e increase in, in ambition for how we're going to try and operate our electricity grid between now and 2030. So we were going to try to get our, what's called an SNSP limit, which is the amount of renewable electricity that the grid can handle at any point in time. We were going to try and increase that from today where we're at at 75% up to 95%. So in the original 70 by 30 report, we would have only considered 90% there. So all in all, what this suite of documents is showing is that there was a lot of policy change since we carried out the 70 by, by 30 report back in 2018. Um, and we wanted to, to bring that forward and, and really bring that study into the next stage of development, which is where we came up with Endgame. So Endgame is our new report, which we launched in June, and it's demonstrating how we can um, reduce our emissions by between now and 2030 in the electricity sector by about 80% um, and how ultimately we can get to a zero carbon electricity system, which is certainly achievable by 2035. And I'll talk through how, how we're going to do that uh, over the next few slides. So just to give you some of the main messages coming out of the report, we found that by 2030, and I should say, by the way, that we worked with um, energy consultants Beringa on both the 70 by 30 report and on the uh, end game report. Um, so we used a lot of the same methodology and, and used the excellent modeling team in Beringa to help uh, bring this to life and, and bring some ideas from some of the, the best minds, I have to say, across the renewable industry in terms of where their vision is at. We really brought that to Beringa and they demonstrated it through all the modeling that you're about to see in the report here tonight. So what we can do, we can get to less than 2 million tons of CO2 compared to where we're at today, which is 9 million tons. And that 9 million tons is actually based off a system in 2019 and most likely 2020. But for 2021, as many of you will know, the electricity system has, has changed quite considerably. We've We've uh, run gas a lot more than we have in previous years. We've run coal significantly more than we have in the last two years. So for 2021, unfortunately, I'd say that 9 million tonnes is more likely to be in the region of maybe 11 million tonnes. So we actually need to get from, say, 11 million tonnes down to 2 million by 2030. And, and it's absolutely doable. How we do this is by using what's called zero carbon system services. So it's basically replacing the backup or uh, fossil fuel generation, which is used to provide system reserves and system support that help keep the lights on at times of high levels of renewables, replacing them with newer technologies, which are zero carbon sources of services. So things like battery energy storage or flywheels or synchronous condensers, um, as well as other voltage support supporting uh, devices. And if we do that, we can actually unlock the delivery of 85% resi between now and 2030. So by not really increasing our renewable capacity very much, but by making it much more efficient through the use of zero carbon system services, we can increase resi from 70% to 85%. And I'll show that in a minute. Critically, what's very important here is that we actually show that we can transition from that 70% target to 85% or to less than 2 million tons at a, zero, at a lower cost to the consumer than we would otherwise be at in the 70% target. And we'll talk through that uh, in, in a little while for how that's possible. The second part of our study then looked at what we would need to do to try and go beyond that. And what that part of the study showed is that a zero carbon power system 
is technically possible by 2030, but it represents a very achievable target in the early 2030s. But in order to get there, we would need to start deploying uh, technologies which work, which are new to Ireland. So the previous phase that I mentioned there where we could get to 85%, that's using technologies that we already have in Ireland. It's more of the same effectively. But for this one, you're really starting to get into some of the more uh, newer technologies that you might have on the grid. So long duration storage and green hydrogen, they play a really central role there. But we also have to look into um, some new policy measures. So we modeled uh, 100 euro per ton uh, of CO2 carbon price floor in the SEM. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what that does, but effectively it makes you choose the renewable option or choose the interconnectors a little more often than you would choose to turn on the gas plant to provide your power. So to talk down through the modeling of that and give maybe just a high level overview of the steps that we went through, and I'll get into a little more detail then later on on, on each individual step, the very first thing that we did was we tried to model the 70% target. So we took those capacities in the program for government. So the 8.2 gigs uh, of onshore wind, the five gigs of offshore wind and the five gigs of solar. And we found, as you'll see here in this table, that in order to hit 70% IZ, you actually only needed to use about 50% of these capacities. So you didn't need to build this out in order to hit your 70% target. So that's there's a little bit of a nuance there between what the government are trying to build in terms of capacity targets versus what the re renewable electricity is. And what we're proposing in this report or showing in this report is you actually don't need to hit those capacity or you don't need to increase those renewable capacity targets further to deliver more renewable electricity. So the first thing we did after we modeled a 70% system, which showed that we would reduce uh, our CO2 in the power sector from 9 million tons down to about 3 million tons, a little over 3 million tons, is we looked at modeling zero carbon system services. So that's effectively where we're able to remove the need for fossil fuel generation being turned on at all times to provide services to the grid like voltage support, like inertia and like reserves. So if you can do that, you can operate your power system at 100% SNSP and what's called zero megawatts minimum generation. And I'll explain what that means uh, uh, shortly through, through a few graphs, but it's basically meaning that you don't need a thermal or a fossil fuel plant on on the system to provide you with these services you can obtain them from other devices like synchronous condensers like battery storage like stack comms for your voltage what this shows is that you can actually save the consumer then 180 million euro per year by doing this compared to the 70 percent target and meantime your your carbon you've probably knocked off about 1.7 million tons of carbon from the electricity sector by doing so so that was phase one for phase two we then started on a path for how you can get to a zero carbon electricity system. So the first thing that we did was we um, added more renewables. So what we found was we increased our renewable capacities from 67% of the program for government target up to 80%. So delivering this, you're really talking about in the region of maybe uh, six, a uh, little over six gigawatts of onshore wind, a little over two and a half gigawatts of uh, offshore wind. We increased that up to 80% of, of these figures here. So you're getting up to about seven and a half gigawatts of, of onshore wind, four gigawatts of offshore wind. What you find is that you do reduce carbon further. You remove another... Uh, 0.3 million tons from the system, but the investment that you've made in terms of renewable capacity to do that uh, hasn't given you the benefit that you might have expected. And the reason for that is that you're not building complementary technologies or complementary solutions to utilize the renewable energy when it's available. So there's a lot of wastage in this, in the, in this scenario. You have a lot of renewable energy that is curtailed, um, that surplus to demand, it's surplus to interconnection availability. So what you really need to do is uh, come up with other technologies that can help use this renewable energy that's being generated and help it to then displace other times when gas generation might be turned on. So that was the next thing that we looked at. We looked at uh, three things. The first thing we looked at is would a higher carbon price help? 
And what we found is it, it definitely does. If you have a higher carbon price, you find that you use the interconnectors differently. You base them more on the, the price of carbon rather than the price of gas or the price of the marginal unit. So at a time when Ireland has lower levels of emissions than say our colleagues in GB or in France, um, we would tend to export more. But at times when they have lower emissions than we do, we would import more. So we'd import the renewables from other jurisdictions rather than making the decision to turn on a gas plant. Um, after that, what we looked at was two things. We looked at long duration storage, which is uh, about 600 megawatts, 640 megawatts of 100 hour storage. So the, the storage devices that we have on our grid today, the batteries that are there, they tend to be of around uh, an order of 30 minutes to an hour. This looked at uh, 100 hour storage. So a technology that's a little different compared to what's on the grid today. Um, and the other thing we looked at was green hydrogen. So could you use an electrolyzer to produce green hydrogen from this excess amount of renewable energy? And what we found was when you put together the high carbon price, when you put together long duration storage on the grid, and when you put together green hydrogen, you can actually really begin to eat into the remaining carbon on the system. So you get down to about uh, 0.3 million tons of CO2 left on the power sector. Your resi in that situation goes up to about 90% renewable electricity. And then the final step that we did was we looked at what would it take to go to a fully zero carbon power system. So in this situation, when you combine the long duration storage, the green hydrogen, and when you actually build out the remaining capacity from your program for government targets, so that 8.2 gigawatts of onshore and 5 gigawatts of offshore, um, you are creating enough renewable energy, you're creating enough hydrogen to be able to power the power system uh, throughout the entire year. And then it really comes down to, can you retrofit the existing gas capacity quickly enough in order to be able to use that hydrogen capacity? Um, and I'll get into that in a little while, but what we're showing here is that if you can deliver all of this capacity, you can get to a situation where you're running the system uh, actually over 100% uh, resi, so we're actually exporting renewable power in that situation, and we don't have any residual carbon left on the grid. So I'm going to talk through these steps in a little bit more detail and provide you with a little more background now. Um, so phase one, which is our, our scenario for less than 2 million tons of CO2, what did we do in that situation? So the first thing that we did is we looked at um, assumptions as, as you do when you're creating a study like this. And I wanted to put this slide in because I imagine a lot of the questions uh, that we see every day on the media at the moment is very much related to electricity demand and what electricity demand will mean for the future. So in our assumptions for this piece of work, we took the projections from Airgrid and Sony's generation capacity statement for how we see uh, or how they see, I should say, uh, demand evolving from 2020 out towards 2030. So you'll see here in our 70 by 30 scenario and in our, our 2 million ton scenario, which is 85% resi, there is a significant increase in demand. Um, a lot of this is from flexible demand from the Climate Action Plan. So there's 1 million electric vehicles in our 2030 scenario. There's 600,000 heat pumps. Uh, when uh, the right control systems are put in place, these offer a very flexible demand on the grid, which is incredibly useful for being able to maximize the amount of um, the efficiency of the renewables that you've installed. There is also a, a considerable increase in large energy users, such as data centers, which um, I'm sure everyone is aware of at the moment, that that's really the big topic of discussion. So in Airgrid and Sony's capacity statement, we were getting up to about 30% of our demand coming from data centers by 2030 in, in what we've modeled here. Um, and that's been that demand assumption that's static throughout all of the scenarios that I'm about to show you. So what we tried to do then in each of the steps is we moved uh, we, we, the optimization or what we were really trying to optimize was emissions. So we weren't trying to deliver a higher res -E. We weren't trying to deliver um, an increased build out in renewable energy or electricity generation. We were actually trying to minimize emissions and what would it take to, to get to that point? So we started off with 2019. We modeled that to make sure that our model was was looking, uh, was fine tuned or should say Beringa modeled it. Um, and then we moved from there to 2030. We replicated a system in 2030 that would deliver 70% uh, renewable electricity. And then from there, we looked at that 2 million ton uh, of CO2 scenario for 2030. What you'll see here as we step down through it is this pink chunk is quite important. So this pink chunk is the emissions from fossil fuel generation 
um, that is required to provide backup services to the grid. So that's fossil fuel generation, predominantly gas uh, fired power plants that are, are spinning consistently to be able to provide things like inertia, things like voltage support uh, reserve to your, your power system. And if you can build enough enabling technology, so demand response, um, synchronous condensers, battery storage, you can remove this pink chunk. And that's a serious uh, chunk of emissions to be able to take out. It's over 1 million tons of CO2. So zero carbon system services are very important. And then when you do that, just to give you a sense of what this means in terms of the renewable percentage, we can move from 43% to 70% to 85%, um, with the majority of our electricity coming from onshore wind, a, a really good chunk coming from offshore wind, and a good chunk coming from solar PV by 2030, with the remainder being made up of hydro and biomass and, and, and waste energy. So you get up to 85% renewable electricity. To talk through zero carbon system services just a little bit because they are really the critical enabler that we need to see in the next few years to be able to make something like this a reality. When you look at a 70% system, there are a number of constraints that are on the grid right now to maintain uh, large thermal units online, be it coal, be it gas. Um, at the moment, there is what's called a minimum generation uh, requirement on the grid. So in that situation, or on, in today's world, I should say, there's a requirement for eight thermal units to be online at all times in Ireland. And there are locational elements to that. So a certain number of those need to be on in Dublin, some need to be on in Cork, some need to be on in Belfast, and some need to be on in Derry, roughly, roughly on the grid to give you a sense of things, and, and around the Money Point region as well. So in our 70 by 30 scenario, what you can see here is that um, we had a, a minimum amount of thermal units that needed to be online of four units in Ireland and then two units in Northern Ireland. And if you can remove that need by having enough batteries or demand response or synchronous condensers on the grid, you remove the need to have those on the system to provide services. And you, instead you only have the thermal units online when they need to be to provide energy. So that's when there isn't enough wind available, there isn't enough solar available. That's when you, you turn on your plants in your zero carbon world. So for the majority of the year, in our, in our less than 2 million ton scenario, we actually have enough renewable power from solar, uh, from wind, with support from demand flexibility and, and battery storage to be able to operate the grid for almost 60% of the time without any thermal units being online. Um, what I wanted to talk through then is just to give you a sense of things. So in that world, you're, you're dealing with, and this is getting to some of the nitty gritty now of the, the electricity constraints that we have currently in our, in our grid, you have uh, SNSP of 100%, so increasing from 75% to 100%. You're keeping some constraints on the grid for inertia. So in this situation, I wanted to show just a graphic. So there is enough flywheels or synchronous condensers on the grid to be able to provide your inertia at all times. So you can see that over the year, they operate very considerably. And then other inertia is provided from things like hydro plants or pumped hydro units um, or waste energy plants, uh, they're also giving you an extra buffer in terms of the amount of inertia you might need. Um, your voltage support and your voltage stability is really being provided by renewable energy all around the grid, um, and then also by uh, the battery energy storage and synchronous condensers, which can really help support the grid there as well. Um, so that's just a bit of background on the, the zero carbon system services. Um, Demand flexibility is so important for a world like this as well. And it's really about trying to maximize the efficiency of your renewables. So trying to minimize any constraint or curtailment on your grid. So in this world that we've painted in 2030, there's over three gigawatts of combined storage and demand side flexibility. So that's uh, various types of battery storage. So uh, quite a bit of what we have on the system today are 30 minute storage to help provide things like primary operating reserve and fast frequency response. But then you're getting into your multi-hour storage, so two hours and three hour storage to help with things like, uh, in some cases, congestion management, uh, very often energy arbitrage, uh, ramping capability is a real um, issue on the grid as well. Um, and then in demand response, we have some flexible demand from our electric vehicles assumed some flexible demand response from say business as usual demands that might be from things like data centers. Um, and what you find here is that when you have a flexible demand, this really helps reduce oversupply of renewables. And what do I mean by oversupply? Well, 
in a world where you have a lot of onshore wind, offshore wind and solar generation, there are going to be days where you're producing more renewable energy than you actually need on your system. So you, you're, you, you're basically have your supply is outstripping your demand um, and you can't export it all the time. Sometimes you just can't, you maximize out the, the interconnector. So when you have flexible demand, it means you can kind of shift the demand to different parts of the day um, or night, wherever the, the wind or the solar is available and really get the, the best efficiency out of it. Um, and it really helps to reduce curtailment. So wasted energy from these renewables um, that you've installed on your grid. Last thing I wanted to show from phase one was just around costs. So we really wanted to get this right. And we really wanted to stress test this with Beringa when we carried out this piece of work. And what we're showing here is the delta in terms of going from a 70% system to an 85% renewable electricity system. Um, or another way to put it, going from a, an electricity system, which is over 3 million tons of CO2 each year to one that is about 1.6 million tons of CO2 each year. Um, in terms of additional costs, th those are what you'll see on top. So there's, go there's more renewables on the grid. So there's going to be an increase in the PSO costs to consumers. So you're going to have to uh, contract these additional renewables through res auction. So there's absolutely cost there. There's going to be uh, an additional network cost. You're going to need to build more grids to be able to move the power from where it's needed, um, or to where it's generated to where it's needed. Um, what we did in that situation when we looked at network costs, um, we took AirGrid's cost assumptions in the shaping our electricity future consultation. We took the most expensive scenario for, for grid cost there, and we used that. And grid, you know, for all intents and purposes, is actually really cheap when you look at the overall cost of your energy system. Um, grid tends to have a lifetime of 50 years. Consumers pay it back over the course of that 50 years. So when it's annualized, your annualized cost of additional grid development is actually relatively minor when you compare it to the cost that you're willing to invest to uh, decarbonize the system in renewables and the cost you're willing to pay if you need to um, use carbon to generate fossil fuels or uh, fossil fuel power on your grid. So, uh, and there's additional DS3 costs just to top that off. So DS3 costs to cover off things like battery storage uh, and, and that type of thing. Um, then from a benefits point of view, there are significant benefits to the grid. So because you have more renewables on, on your grid, because you have more batteries, you've lower wholesale energy costs. So a lot of what is driving the electricity bill increases at the moment that we're hearing about in the news is really significantly higher wholesale costs. Um, and that's really been driven by two things, very high gas prices and very high carbon prices. If you have more renewables, they can drive down that cost and that's a benefit to everybody. So your wholesale energy costs almost completely cancel out or the, your wholesale energy benefits almost completely cancel out your wholesale costs. But the other really big benefit that you're getting is you're not paying fossil fuel generators to turn on to provide services. So in that graph that I showed a few minutes ago, where you've got four units online at all times in Ireland and two units in Northern Ireland, you're paying those generators to produce power because they have to in order to provide the services. But if you can get your services from technologies and devices that don't need to produce power at the same time, then that's a huge cost saving. So today in Ireland, we pay about over 200 million euro every year for, for uh, thermal generators to be turned on to provide services. So if you don't have that cost anymore, it's a huge saving. So the net saving here from a 70% scenario to an 85% scenario is a net saving of 180 million euro. Um, and that can be invested in other areas. And I'll show some suggested areas for investment uh, shortly. The second phase of the study really then looked at how you might move from that uh, less than 2 million ton scenario from 2030 to a fully zero carbon power system. So just to refresh memories there, the really critical things that we're looking at there are things like carbon pricing, long duration storage, uh, and green hydrogen. Those are the three critical enablers. When we look at them, individually. So a high carbon price, um, at the time when we were doing the report, uh, we thought that a high carbon price or a realistic carbon price could be 100 euro per ton of CO2. So there is a, a non-ETS target that government have set in the climate action plan for things like domestic heating and, and diesel and petrol for 100 euro per ton of CO2. 
in the non-ETS sector. So we look to align that in the ETS sector. Now, what we've seen in recent months is actually that the ETS sector might be getting to that point itself without the need for any government or political intervention to set a carbon price floor. So just to give you some context, back in, in January, the cost of emitting one tonne of CO2 in the electricity sector was about 32 euro. Today, that cost is actually 64 euro. So we've seen a double doubling of the, the cost of carbon in electricity generation in the ETS sector um, in nine months. So suddenly our 100 euro per tonne of CO2 price is actually looking per, perhaps a little um, generous compared to what it might be in 2030 if the ETS sector keeps increasing the way it does. Interestingly, what we found here is when you have that carbon price, as I mentioned earlier, interconnectors begin to trade on the price of carbon rather than on the marginal price of the fuel. So today, uh, what the interconnectors are really looking for is a price differential between what the cost of electricity production in Ireland is versus what the cost of electricity production in Great Britain is. And if it's cheaper to produce electricity in Ireland, then we'll export to Great Britain and vice versa. What you actually see when you have a high carbon price is that interconnectors trade on carbon much more. So that choice to either turn on a thermal plant in Ireland that produces carbon versus importing uh, energy from Great Britain or from France that might be of a lower uh, carbon intensity, you tend to import much more. Um, and the amount of time and usage of the interconnectors over the course of the year is increased. Um, we've aligned the carbon price between the Irish GB and, and French markets as well. And the reason that we did that was because if you introduce a carbon price floor in Ireland only, but not in the British or French markets, you actually get a, an even bigger reduction in carbon savings because it costs more to produce carbon in Ireland than it does in those markets. So you tend to import much more. But conservatively, we, we kept it that the carbon price was the same in each market. So you really do get quite a considerable carbon reduction from the electricity sector, 0.7 million tonnes just by uh, what is in effect um, almost a, a stroke of a pen. There is no infrastructure required here. There is nothing physical that needs to be built here. It's the, the carbon price is something that can be done through policy changes rather than needing new grid build or new infrastructure build. The second thing that we looked at was then long duration storage. So in this situation, we looked at um, 640 megawatts of 100 hour storage um, within Ireland. And, that 640 megawatts, there's a number of different technologies which can provide that. So we have Turlock Hill here in Ireland, which is a pumped hydro storage unit. Um, a pumped hydro storage is, is really well known around the world. There's there's uh, dozens of facilities there. We've 30 year, we've 50 years of experience of operating um, uh, one here in Ireland. There's other types of technologies like compressed air energy storage. Um, like uh, liquid salt, molten salt, which is very popular in Spain. So there, there are longer duration energy storage technologies that are there. And what this study showed is that if you roll them out, um, it, it allows uh, better optimization of renewable electricity. So you store it during times when you have excess renewable generation, and then you displace the gas fired generation. And really importantly, if you actually put these in the right places of the network, you can really make a dent in network constraints. So you can really begin to remove network constraints if you place this storage in a, in a part of the grid which is heavily constrained. Um, so places like maybe the Northwest or the West, um, there is definitely an optimization which could be done there to locate these in really good parts of the grid to help uh, even provide more benefits than what we're showing here. Um, and then the last technology that we looked at was green hydrogen. So in this type of a scenario, we looked at what would happen if you have electrolyzers on the system to produce hydrogen when power prices are low. So in this world, I think we had about 1300 megawatts of electrolyzers on the grid. Um, so those 1300 me uh, megawatts of electrolyzers, they had a 70% efficiency factor. So they took in electricity and 70% of the output became hydrogen. Um, that was then utilized in 900 megawatts of retrofitted gas fired power stations. So we did a lot of um, investigative work into what it would take to retrofit an existing gas fired power station in Ireland to run on hydrogen. So we talked with a lot of, um, of the turbine OEMs. So we talked with Siemens, Mitsubishi, GE, 
And what we found there was that the cost of doing this is actually relatively small. You, you retrofitting burners, it was surprisingly small, to be honest. Um, and, and it is certainly something that's doable. Uh, our, our gas network in Ireland is, is equipped to be able to carry hydrogen to a certain extent as well. So this is a really real option if we can sort out uh, certain challenges like hydrogen storage. So hydrogen storage is probably the biggest barrier uh, to being able to deliver a future like this, but there are some really interesting projects um, that companies like DecarbonX or EIH2 are really starting to kick off in various parts of Ireland at the moment as well on, on that. But what you find in this situation is that green hydrogen that you've created using your electrolyzer, um, you can actually use that during times then of uh, hours when gas generation would otherwise be used. Uh, so in that situation, when you're in a, a really high renewables uh, portfolio and a really high res -E system, the amount of hours in the year when you're actually using gas generation is really low. So you're, you're in the 300 to 500 hours per year where you're dispatching gas. So the hydrogen can make a really big dent in that if you were to retrofit uh, about two units for 900 megawatts of, of, of hydrogen fire generation. Um, if you combine all of these together, if you retrofit the entire gas fleet, um, which is, is, is technically possible, huge economic and, and policy challenges to doing that, and that's very well recognized, um, but that was an option that we looked at here, you can actually reduce your power system emissions to zero. So in this type of a world, we have 60 terawatt hours of demand, 58 of that's met by wind and solar generation, especially when you combine things like battery storage, um, uh, flexible demand, two terawatt hours of that is, is met by biomass waste and hydro, which are already on the system. And then two terawatt hours comes from the hydrogen fired units. So in total, we're actually net exporting a very small amount of capacity here as well. So this is something that is technically possible by 2030 and uh, is, is beginning to look uh, achievable in the early 2030s, which is why I began this presentation with that uh, uh, statement at the outset that we can do this by 2035. And that's what we should really be aiming for. One last thing I wanted to focus on in relation to the costs was if you remember that almost save that that saving or that that budget that we created for ourselves in phase one, where we had 180 million euro savings from from being able to operate the system at a less than two million tons compared to 70 percent. What we did is we, we looked at that saving and we took that as a baseline and we said, how much could you invest while still having a saving to the consumer? And we looked at the technology costs of things like long duration storage, green hydrogen, and both of them combined. And you can actually begin to build that technology, uh, which absolutely has a cost attributed to it. But you can still save consumers money by investing in this type of technology. If you want to transition to a fully zero carbon power system, there is a cost to the consumer compared to a 70 percent scenario. Um, for sure, but that cost is relatively minor when you consider you're completely removing all of your carbon from the power system. Um, so in the report, we go into a lot of detail on this. If anyone has any really specific questions on what our assumptions are, um, there's a lot of details and a lot of appendices in the report covering off this point. So just to, to conclude and to almost wrap up, um, main messages are really that we can deliver a power system with less than 2 million tons of CO2. So we can go from where we're at today uh, maybe 9 million tonnes, 11 million tonnes, down to 2 million tonnes by, by 2030. Doing that delivers 85% res -E. Um, So great to see the government increasing the renewable electricity target earlier this week from 70% to 80%. Um, it's absolutely achievable. And you can actually save consumers 180 million euro by doing this. One thing I really wanted to call out, um, uh, this uh, a completely underlying assumption to all of this is that we need the electricity grid to be strengthened. So we, we need the delivery of critical grid infrastructure projects. So north-south interconnector needs to be delivered to make something like this a reality. We need to see Celtic interconnector delivered between Ireland and France. We need to see the Greenlink interconnector delivered between Ireland and Great Britain. And we really need more and further investment in the DS3 programme. So the programme that's enabled us to get to 75% SNSP today, we need to see more revenue and more certainty being placed on those revenue streams um, from the regulators, from Airgrid, from ESB, uh, to be able to deliver a future like this. Um, and then longer term, uh, we can definitely get to a system where in the early 2030s, we could be operating the power grid uh, at, at 
a, a zero carbon power system. And as per what the IDA have recommended, as what the for, to what the UK have committed to earlier this week, it should be something that we're trying to do in Ireland. Um, and there is absolutely a viable pathway to get us there if we deploy technologies new to Ireland, but not new to other jurisdictions. So long duration storage and green hydrogen and with a fair carbon price to represent that price. So just to conclude, we this is something we can do. We have huge experience in the electricity sector of being able to set a target and meet it. We have a track record of delivery here. We have some of the smartest people in the world working in our electricity sector in Ireland. So if we set ourselves this objective, I'm very confident that we can actually do it. So with that, I might uh, stop.